between Western psychology, psychiatry, and psychotherapy, and the so-called religions of Asia, there is common ground because both are interested in changing states of human consciousness. Whereas institutional Western religion, Christianity, Judaism, and even Islam, are relatively less interested in this matter. Western religions are more concerned with behavior, doctrine, and belief than with any transformation of the way in which we are aware of ourselves and of the world. But this matter concerns psychiatry and psychology very much. Only those states of consciousness which are not normal are usually treated in Western psychology as being in some way sick. There are, of course, exceptions to this, and there have increasingly been exceptions in the work of Jung and to some extent even of Grodek, of Prinzhorn, of more modern people, Rogers and Ronald Lang. Changing consciousness is often looked upon as a form of therapy. But in general, different states of consciousness from the normal are regarded as a form of sickness. And therefore, official and institutional psychiatry constitutes itself the guardian of sanity and of socially approved experience of reality. And very often it seems to me that reality appears rather much the way the world is seen on a bleak Monday morning. <laughs> In this official doctrine, I might even say dogma, of what reality is. Because after all, we know that our science, such as it is of psychology, is founded in the scientific naturalism of the 19th century. And the metaphysical and mythological assumptions of that science still underlie a great deal of psychological thinking in behaviorism eminently, but also to a large extent in official psychoanalysis. Indeed, one might say that psychoanalysis is based on Newtonian mechanics and, in fact, could be called psychohydraulics. <laughs> Not that that analogy is altogether uh, inappropriate, because there are certainly respects in which our psychic life flows and exhibits the dynamics of water. But, of course, we want to know what kind of water. And for the scientific naturalism of the 19th century, the basic energies of nature were considered to be very much inferior to human consciousness in quality. Ernst Haeckel, a biologist of that time, would think of the energy of the universe as blind energy. And correspondingly, it seems to me that Freud thought of the libido as essentially blind, unconscious energy, embodying only a kind of formless, unstructured, and insatiable lust. This is a generalization. Some modification in that thinking is, of course, possible. But the tendency is to regard all that which lies below the surface of human consciousness as being less evolved, because you must remember that this was also the time of Darwin's theories of evolution, of seeing the human mind as a fortuitous development from much more primitive forms of life coming forth by purely mechanical processes, by natural selection, and by the survival of the fittest. And therefore, man was in general seen 
as a fluke of nature, an embodiment of reason, emotion and values for which the more basic processes of nature had no sympathy and about which they did not care. If therefore the human race is to flourish, we must take charge of evolution. It can no longer be left to spontaneous process, but it must be directed by human ingenuity, despite the fact that although our brains are capable of dealing with a colossal number of variables at once, our conscious attention is not. Most people cannot consider more than three variables at the same time without using a pencil. And this shows that in many ways the scanning process of man's conscious attention is very inadequate for dealing with the infinitely many variables, the multidimensional processes of the natural universe. However, a serious attempt has been made and scientific naturalism issued in a fantastic fight with nature. In this whole notion of the conquest and subordination of nature, which has, as a matter of fact, very ancient, non-scientific and biblical origins, with the idea of man as the head and chief and ruler of nature in the image of God. And the time has now dawned upon us all when our attempts to beat nature into submission are having alarming results. Because we see that it's very dangerous to mess around with processes that we don't understand that have enormous numbers of variables and we begin to wonder whether we hadn't better let well enough alone. At the same time, although I said that Western psychology had more in common or more common interest with Oriental religion than it does with Western religion, there is a sense in which psychiatry and psychotherapy are becoming the religion of the West. Psychoanalysis has much in common with the forms and procedures of institutional religion. There is, for example, apostolic succession. <laughs> the passing down of mana, of qualified power to practice therapy, from the father founder, Sigmund Freud, through his immediate apostles, to an enormous company of archbishops and bishops. <laughs> Among whom there are, of course, as there were with Christianity, heresiarchs, such as Jung and Grodek and Rank and Reich. And uh, the, the heresiarchs are duly excommunicated and anathematized. There are rituals, as there are also rituals with religion. There is the sacrament of the couch. <laughs> there is the spiritual discipline of free association. There is the mystic knowledge of the interpretation of dreams. And are, there are also the two great symbolic fetishes, the long one and the round one. <clears throat> Now, it's extraordinarily easy to make fun of all this. And we must not forget that we owe a tremendous debt to Freud, if for nothing else than pointing out that that much of ourselves of which we are aware in terms of the conscious ego is not really ourselves. It is something superficial. However we define its nature, it is superficial. And the realities of human life are not under the gaze of its scanning process, at least not in the ordinary way. And that was a tremendous revelation. There's no question about that. But one sees 
troublesome signs when the doctrines and processes of psychiatry, psychoanalysis and so forth become officialized. And I think Thomas Sass in his books The Myth of Mental Illness and The Manufacture of Madness is pointing out something extremely important to us, which is that in effect the psychological official of today is the priest and that he is beginning to exercise the same sort of controls over human life as were exercised by the church in the Middle Ages. So that a professor of psychiatry at Columbia or Harvard or Yale medical schools has today the same sort of intellectual re respectability and authority as the professor of theology at the University of Toledo or Padua would have had in the year 1400. Now you must realize that the theologians of those days not simply believed in their cosmology and the theology, they almost knew it was true in the same way that our scientists know certain things to be true despite the fact that they change their opinions very often, while they hold them, they have in effect the force of dogma, as witness the anathematization of Velikovsky for his uncomfortable ideas. And therefore, there are heresies existing today which are persecuted in the same way as heresies were persecuted by the Holy Inquisition. And they are persecuted out of kindness in exactly the same way that the Holy Inquisition persecuted heresy out of kindness and deep concern for human beings. That is unimaginable to us, but it was so. For after all, if you seriously believe that someone who did not hold the Catholic faith and who voluntarily rejected it would be tortured physically and spiritually forever and ever and ever in hell. You would resort to almost any means to preserve a fellow human being from such a fate. Especially if the complaint or disease of heresy from which he suffered was infectious. you would first of all reason with him. And if he was not responsive to reason, you would resort to abuse and to forceful argument. And if he was not responsive to that, you would give him shock treatment and bang him about. If that didn't work, the thumb screw and the rack and the Iron Maiden. And if that didn't work as a last desperate resort, you would burn him at the stake in the pious hope that in the midst of those searing fires he would think better and make a last act of perfect contrition and so be rescued from everlasting damnation. And you did all this within the spirit of this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. <laughs> in the spirit of a surgeon who is very, very sorry indeed that he has to uh, make you undergo this extremely painful operation. But it is in your best interests and there really is at least a 50-50 chance that you may survive. <laughs> and so therefore, in perfectly scientific medical spirit, people may be very arbitrarily and without due process deprived of their civil rights, incarcerated in prisons that are in many cases much worse than prisons for criminals, and generally left to rot be neglected and ignored, and when bumptious, given shock treatment or put in solitary confinement. For what? Because they have unorthodox and heretical states of consciousness. A lot of these people are not dangerous until provoked into being dangerous by being ignored, by being treated as machines, and in generally defined as non-human. And if you are defined as non-human, there's precious little you can do about it. 
because everything you say that sounds human will be taken as a kind of utterance of a mechanical man, as imitating humanness out of lunatic cunning. You will be suspicious. Everything you say will be listened to in a different way and with different ears. And you will have one hell of a time talking yourself out of it. Because there really are no rules as to what one must do when incarcerated for having unorthodox consciousness. There is no clear road to repentance. And this is found likewise in jails where people are incarcerated on one to ten year sentences as in places like Vacaville, California where when I visited such prisons young men have come to me in perfect desperation saying I don't know what's happened to me because I want to uh, live like a decent citizen I know I've done things that are wrong but I simply don't know what, I, what is expected of me here if I try to do what's expected they say I'm compliant and that seems to be some sort of a sickness. Thomas Sass drew attention to this when he quoted a discussion of the types of school children who may very well need therapy. There were overachieving children. There were underachieving children. There were children who exhibited erratic patterns. There were children who were sort of dully mediocre. In fact, every sort of child can be given a diagnostic name for his behavior which sounds sick as Jung once suggested life itself is a disease with a very poor prognosis it lingers on for years and invariably ends with death <laughs> and I submit that in our present knowledge of the human mind such power in the hands of psychiatrists is amazingly dangerous for I would suggest that today we know about as much concerning the human mind as we knew about the galaxy in 1300. <coughs> and that while there are indeed individuals who are certainly able to perform psychotherapy, it is the sheerest arrogance for anybody to say that he is officially qualified to do so. We do not know how it is done just as we do not know really how musical artistic and literary genius is done you cannot really teach it you can put the tools for doing these things into people's hands and you can show them how to use the tools but whether they will use those tools with genius is quite unpredictable and this is above all true of the art of psychotherapy we don't know how it's done We've got some vague ideas. There probably are some people who by reason of their mental derangement are probably not qualified to perform it because they are maybe out just to make other people into messes. But to say that there are certain standards and certain examinations that can be passed and certificates that could be issued which do indeed qualify people for this work is I think pernicious nonsense. <coughs> and is used, of course, out of economic self-interest when those who consider themselves official therapists run into competition. The same was done by religion. I was talking, imagine it, to a Buddhist priest in Thailand some years ago. I was looking at some books in a bookshop in the precincts of a Buddhist temple. And I was wandering over and uh, I noticed a book on a certain form of Buddhist meditation. And I murmured, hmm, Satipatthana, which is the name of a certain kind of Buddhist meditation. And uh, a voice suddenly said to me, you practice Satipatthana? I looked up and there was a skinny Buddhist monk in a yellow robe with rather red eyes looking at me. I said, not exactly Satipatthana. I use a different method. It's called Zen. Oh, Satipatthana, not Zen. I said, oh, well, it's something like it, isn't it? No. Well, it's rather like yoga, I said, isn't it? Not yoga, no. Satipatthana, different. Only right way. <laughs> well, look, I said to him, I have a lot of Roman Catholic friends who tell me that their way is the only right way. Who am I to believe? You know, I said, you know, you're like someone who's got a, uh, 
a ferry boat for crossing the river. I used a Buddhist simile. And another fellow down the stream has opened up ferry business. And you go to the government and say, he's not authorized to operate a ferry boat because he's competition to you. Let all operate ferry boats who will. And if you haven't got the sense to get off, to stay off one that sinks, it's your fault. <laughs> and after all, I could say to him, you believe that everything that happens to you is your own karma. So why worry? But now, it's so interesting that since official psychiatry, and I underline that word official because I hope those of you in this audience who are therapists will regard yourselves as unofficial. <laughs> At least that'll give you an out. <laughs> but nevertheless, official psychiatry has curious things in common with Western religion as well as with Eastern. With Eastern, I said, only in so far as it has an interest in states of consciousness and inclines to regard other states of consciousness than the ordinary as sick. But it has one very important feature in common with Western religion. And to that, we have to go a little bit into Western religious history and ask ourselves what in Western religion, and especially in Christianity, and this goes also for Judaism, Islam, what is the great heresy? Curiously enough, the great heresy was first in the West committed by no lesser person than Jesus Christ, who believed himself to be God. This, of course, will be unquestionably true if you think that the Gospel of St. John has historical value. It's a little vaguer in the Synoptic Gospels, but if you read the Gospel of St. John, there is absolutely no doubt about it, for he said, I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He said all that, according to this Gospel. And that is something that in the Western world you are not supposed to say. And especially you are not supposed to believe it. <laughs> And naturally, it was very difficult for Jesus because he was saying all this in the context of the Hebrew culture. And he tried to find language in the Hebrew scriptures with which to express his state of consciousness because he had an unusual state of consciousness. As I read it, he had cosmic consciousness otherwise known as mystical experience, otherwise known as moksha, nirvana, bodhi, satori, fana alvana, or what you will. And that happens to people. It has happened as far back as we know. It happens all over the world and in all cultures. We don't know very much about it. We don't really know ways in which to make it happen because it seems to be of the nature of it that it is a spontaneous surprise. But it unquestionably happens. And most people keep their mouths shut about it when it does. I had a friend who in the middle of having a stroke had this illumination. And he said to me, I fear to speak to my friends of this, but it was the most beautiful experience. I shall never be afraid of death. In fact, I recommend everyone to have a stroke. <laughs> this was my friend Jean Varda, lately deceased Greek painter. But Jesus certainly had this transformation of consciousness. And he was crucified for it. Why? Because he had committed an act of insubordination and treason against the cosmic government. <clears throat> Because if you believe that God is a monarch, an absolute omniscient and omnipotent authority, shall we say a sort of cosmic ego, 
then to claim to be that is to introduce democracy into the kingdom of heaven, to usurp divine authority, and to speak in its name without proper authorization. And they asked Jesus, by what authority do you speak, of heaven or of men? And he was tricky about answering that one. He said, by what authority did John the Baptist speak? And they were nervous about answering that one. He could have asked, by what authority did Isaiah speak, etc. Or Moses. But Moses became official authority. And if you could wangle it, that what you said was simply an extension of what Moses said, because Rabbi so-and-so said it, who got it from Rabbi so-and-so, who got it from Rabbi so-and-so, who got it from Rabbi so-and-so, who got it from Moses, then it's okay. Notice this. That to be an authority today in the academic world depends on documentation. It's not enough to say, for I say unto you, you must put in your footnotes. And the more the footnotes, the more the authority, obviously. <laughs> so, our dissertations tend to be books about books, about books about books, and our libraries multiply by mitosis. <laughs> I have a friend, a girl, who's very intelligent and articulate, and she was born blind. And she hasn't the faintest idea what darkness is. The word means as little to her as the word light. So if you went to sleep, you're not aware of darkness when you're asleep. And so if you went into sleep into unconsciousness for always and always and always. It wouldn't be at all like going into the dark. It wouldn't be at all like being buried alive. It would be as if, as a matter of fact, you had never existed at all. Not only you, but everything else as well. You would be in that state as if you had never been. And there, of course, there would be no problems. There would be no one to regret the loss of anything. You couldn't even call it a tragedy because there would be no one to experience it as a tragedy. It would be simple, nothing at all. Forever and for never. Because not only would you have no future, you would also have no past and no present. Now, you would think that that was a point where we'd say, well, let's talk about something else. But I'm not content with that. I demur. Because this makes me think of two other things. This state of nothingness makes me think, first of all, The, the only thing I, I get anywhere in my experience that's close to nothingness is the way my head looks to my eyes. Because I seem to feel that there is a world out there, as it were, confronting my eyes. And then behind my eyes, there isn't a black spot. There isn't even a hazy spot. There's nothing at all. I'm not aware of my head, as it were, as a black hole in the middle of all this luminous visual experience. It doesn't even have very clear edges because the field of vision is an oval. And if I run my fingers along my field of vision, it's like this. And this is the point where my fingers just disappear from sight. Vague edged. But then behind this oval of vision, there is nothing at all, just from the sense of sight. Of course, if I use my fingers and touch, I can feel something behind my eyes. But if I use the sense of sight alone, there's just nothing there at all. Now, nevertheless, out of that Blankness, I see. 
Well, that's the first thing it makes me think of. Now, the next thing it makes me think of is this. If, when I'm dead, I am as if I never had been, then that's the way I was before I was born. Because just as if I try to go back behind my eyes and find what is there, I come to a blank. If I try to remember back and back and back and back, I've got my earliest memories. And then behind them, nothing. Total blank. But just as I know there's something behind my eyes by using my fingers on my head, so I know through other sources of information that before I was born, there was something going on. There were my father and my mother and their fathers and mothers and the whole material environment of the earth and its life out of which they came and behind that the solar system and behind that the galaxy and behind that all the galaxies and behind that another blank space. So, I reason that if I go back when I'm dead to the state where I was before I was born, couldn't I happen again? You know, what has happened once can very well happen again. If it happened once, it's extraordinary. And it's not really very much more extraordinary if it happened all over again. So, in other words... I do know for certain, because I've seen people die, and I've seen people born after them, that at any rate, after I die, not only somebody, but myriads of other beings will be born. That I know. We all know that. There's no doubt about it. But what worries us is that when we're dead, there could be nothing at all forever, as if that was something to worry about. Before you were born, there was this same nothing at all forever, and yet you happened. And if you happened once, you can happen again. Now, what does that mean? Well, we'll get at it first in its very simplest way. And to explain myself, I must invent a new verb. This is the verb to I. And in the first place, we'll spell that with the letter I. But instead of having it as a pronoun, we'll call it a verb. The universe eyes. It has eyed in me and it eyes in you. Now, let's re-spell the word E-Y-E. -E. When I talk about to eye something, it means to look at something, to be aware of something. So we'll change the spelling and we'll say the universe eyes. It becomes aware of itself in each one of us. And it keeps on eyeing. And every time it eyes, every one of us in whom it eyes feels that he is the center of the whole thing. And that I know that you feel that you are I in just the same way that I feel that I am I. And we all have the same background of nothing. We don't remember having done it before. And yet it has been done before. Again and again and again, not only before in time, but all around us everywhere else in space is everybody is the universe eyeing. Now look, let me try and make this clearer in this way. When I say it's the universe eyeing, who is eyeing? What do you mean by I? Well, there are two things you can mean by it. On the one hand, you can mean what's called your ego, your personality. But that's not your real eyeing because your personality is your idea of yourself. It's your image of yourself. And that's made up of how you feel yourself, how you think about yourself, thrown in with what all your friends and relations have told you about yourself. So, your image of yourself, however, obviously isn't you any more than your photograph is you, or any more than uh, the image of anything is it. 
All our images of ourselves are nothing more than caricatures. They contain no information, for most of us, on how we grow our brains, how we work our nerves, how we circulate our blood, how we secrete with our glands, and how we shape our bones. That isn't contained in the sensation or the image we call the ego. So obviously then, the ego image is not myself. So myself contains all these factors that we could say the body is doing, the circulation of the blood, the breathing, the electrical activity of the nerves, all this is me, but I don't know anything about it. I don't know how it came together. I don't know how it's constructed. And yet I do all that. If it is true also to say I breathe, I walk, I think, I am conscious. I don't know how I manage to be, but I do it in the same way as I grow my hair. So, I must therefore locate the center of me, my eyeing, at a deeper level than my ego, which is my image or idea of myself. But how deep do we go? We can say the body is the I. But the body comes out of the rest of the universe, comes out of all its energy. So it's the universe that's eyeing. And the universe eyes in the same way that a tree apples or that a star shines. And the center of the appling is the tree. The center of the shining is the star. And so the basic center or self of the eyeing which is called in this case Alan Watts, which is only a name for this particular physical organism flowering from, shining out of this particular environment, makes the center of all this eyeing the eternal universe, or eternal. The thing has existed for 10,000 million years and will probably go on for at least that much more. So we won't worry about how long it goes on. But repeatedly it eyes. So that it seems to me absolutely reasonable to assume that when I die and this physical body evaporates and the whole memory system with it, then it will be all over once again the awareness that I had before, not exactly the same way, but of a baby being born. There will, of course, be myriads of babies born, not only baby human beings, but baby frogs, baby rabbits, baby fruit flies, baby viruses, baby bacteria. And which one of them am I going to be? Only one of them, and yet every one of them, because this experience comes always in the singular, one at a time. But certainly one of them. Actually, it doesn't make much difference, because if I were born again as a fruit fly, I would think that being a fruit fly was the normal, ordinary course of events. And naturally, I would think that I was an important person, a highly cultured being, because fruit flies obviously have a high culture. We don't even know how to look for it. But probably they have all sorts of symphonies and music and artistic performances in the way light is reflected on their wings in different ways, the way they dance in the air. And they say, oh, look at her, she has real style. Look how the sunlight comes off her wings. And they in their world think they're as important and as civilized as we do in our world. So that if I were to wake up as a fruit fly, I wouldn't feel any different, as it were, than I do when I wake up as a human being. I would be used to it. Well, you say, though, it wouldn't be me. Because if it would be me again, I would have to remember how I was before. All right, but you don't now remember how you were before. And yet, you're content enough to be the me that you are. In fact, 
it's a thoroughly good arrangement in this world that we don't remember what it was before. Why? Because variety is the spice of life. And if we remembered, 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 having done this again and again and again and again, we should get bored. And uh, just as a memory is a beautiful thing to have, to remember, without memory we can't be intelligent. But just as I have explained that in order to see the figure you have to have the background, in order that a memory be valuable you've also got to have a forgettery. That's why we sleep every night to refresh ourselves. We go into the unconscious so that coming back to the conscious is again a great experience. Well, when that's gone on long enough, when day after day we remember the days that, that have gone before, even though there's the interval of sleep, there comes a point when really, if we consider what is to our true liking, we will want to forget everything that went before so that we can have the extraordinary experience of seeing the world once again through the eyes of a baby, whatever kind of baby, so that it's completely new. We have all the startling wonder that a child has, all the vividness of perception, which we can't have if we remember everything forever. So do you see what happens? The universe is a system which not only forgets itself and then again remembers anew, so that there's always this constant change and constant variety in the span of time, but it also does it in the span of space by looking at itself through every different living organism to give, as it were, an all-round view. You know, that's a way of getting rid of prejudice, getting rid of a one-sided view. So, death, in that sense, is a tremendous release from monotony. It puts an interval of total forgetting in a rhythmic process of on and off, on and off, so that you can begin all over again and never be bored. But the point is that if you fantasize the idea of being nothing for always and always and always, what you're really saying is, after I'm dead, the universe stops. And what I'm saying is, no, it goes on just as it did when you were born. You see, you may say that you think it incredible that you have more than one life. But I say, first of all, is it isn't it incredible that you have this one? Isn't it incredible that out of the nothing that is your past, here you are? Well, it's astonishing. So, if that's astonishing, it can always happen again and again and again. Now, What this is saying then is that just as you don't know how you manage to be conscious, how you manage to grow and shape this body of yours, that doesn't mean to say that you're not doing it. Equally, you don't know how the universe shines the stars constellates the constellation and galactifies the galaxies. You don't know. But that doesn't mean to say that you aren't doing it in just the same way as you're breathing without knowing how you breathe. If I say really and truly, I am this whole universe, or put it in another way, uh, this particular organism is an eyeing being done by the whole universe. And somebody could say to me, well, who the hell do you think you are? Are you God? Do you warm up the galaxies? Canst thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loosen the bonds of Orion? And I reply to that, who the hell do you think you are? Can you tell me how you grow your brain, how you shape your eyeballs, and how you manage to see? Well, if you can't tell me that, I can't tell you how I warm up the galaxy. Only I've located the center of myself at a deeper 
a more universal level, than we are, in our culture, accustomed to do. So then, if that universal energy is the real me, the real self which eyes as all these different organisms spread out in different spaces or places and happening again and again and again at different times, we've got a marvelous system going in which you can be eternally surprised. The universe is really a system which keeps on surprising itself. The ambition that many of us have, especially in, a, in an age of technological competence, to have everything under our control is a false ambition because you've only got to think for one moment, what would it be like if you did really know and control everything? Supposing we had a super colossal technology which could go to our wildest dreams of technological competence so that everything that is going to happen would be foreknown, predicted, and everything would be under our control. Why, you know, it'd be like making love to a plastic woman. There would be no surprise in it. No sudden answering touch, as when we touch another human being, it's not like touching something made of plastic. There comes out a response, something unexpected. And that's what we really want. When we want to relate to the other, you see, you can't experience the feeling you call self unless it's in contrast with the feeling of other. It's like known and unknown, light and dark, positive and negative. Other is necessary in order for you to feel self. So then, isn't that the arrangement you want? And so in the same way, couldn't you say the arrangement you want is not to remember. Memory is always remember a form of control. I've got it in mind. I remember it. I know your number. You're under control. Now, if you go on remembering and remembering and remembering, it's like writing on a piece of paper and going on writing and writing and writing until there's no white space left on the paper. Your memory is filled up. And so you need to wipe it all clean so that you have a white paper all over again and can begin to write on it once more. So that's what death does for us. It wipes the slate clean and also, for looking at it from the point of view of population and the human organism on the planet, it keeps cleaning us out. And the idea of a technology which would enable each one of us to be immortal would be something that would progressively crowd the planet with people with hopelessly crowded memories. They would, as it were, be like people living in a house where they'd accumulated so much property, so many books, so many vases, so many sets of knives and forks, so many tables and chairs, so many newspapers, that there wouldn't be any room to move around. To live, we need space. And space is a kind of nothingness. And death is a kind of nothingness. It's all the same principle. And by putting blocks, as it were, or spaces of nothingness, spaces of space, in between spaces of something, we get life properly spaced out. To use the German word Lebensraum, room for living. That's what space gives us. And that's what death gives us. Now look, notice that in everything I've said about death, I haven't brought in anything that I could call spookery. I haven't brought in any information about anything that you don't already know. I haven't invoked any mysterious knowledge about souls, memory of former lives, anything like that. I've just talked about it in terms that we already know, so that if you say, well, all this idea that people have of life beyond the grave is just wishful thinking, I say, okay, I'll grant that. Let's assume that that is wishful thinking and that when we are dead, there just won't be anything. See, let's 
Face that fact. That'll be the end. Now, notice first of all, that's the worst thing you've got to fear. Does it frighten you? Who's going to be afraid? Supposing it ends, no more problems. But then, you will see that this nothingness, if you followed my argument, is something, as it were, you bounce off from again, just as you bounced in the first place when you were born. You bounced out of nothingness. Nothingness is a kind of bounce. Because it implies, the nothing implies something. So you bounce back. All new, all different. Nothing to compare it with before. A refreshing experience. And if, therefore, you get this sense, just like you've got the sense of nothing behind your eyes. Get the sense of nothingness, very powerful, frisky nothingness, underlying your whole being. And there's nothing in that nothing to be afraid of. Then, with that sense, you can come on like a person for whom the rest of life is gravy because you're already dead. You know you're going to die. We say there's one thing certain, which is death and taxes. And the death of each one of us now is as certain as it would be if we were going to die five minutes from now. So where's your anxiety? Where's your hang-up? Regard yourself as dead already so that you have nothing to lose. Turkish proverb says, he who sleeps on the floor will not fall out of bed. So in the same way, the person who regards himself as already dead, who, therefore, you are virtually nothing. A hundred years from now, you'll be a handful of dust. That'll be for real. All right, act on that reality.